two we've learned. He has a background as a hockey fan, an interest in the Minnesota Wild, and a former hockey player himself. He tells us his hockey playing days preceded the days of the hockey mask, but uh, he, must, he must have avoided many contacts with that puck since his visage seems unscarred. I present to you Dr. Robert Mundell. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here and a great honor to receive this honorary degree from Gustavus Adolphus College. Uh, I'm uh, going to talk today on the subject, uh, does the world need a global currency? Does the global economy need a world currency? Um, and uh, to set the stage for that, I want to begin by commenting on a few key factors that are important things to take into account in the world economy. There are five factors I want to uh, put as the backdrop of this uh, lecture. Uh, the first uh, factor is the new economy and the way in which the new economy has affected um, the lives of everyone around us. It's in economics, it's affected uh, factors of production, it's affected households, it's affected uh, governments and all institutions. And uh, it's uh, reflected in the uh, new technology which has lowered costs in all aspects of economic life and increased productivity everywhere. And uh, it's, uh, uh, I think, uh, if you were looking for a, a common uh, analogy, it would be like a combination of the uh, electricity revolution and the printing press rolled into one. The second trend I want to talk about is mention, not talk about, is the um, <clears throat> globalization. Um, I just uh, came back from the Prague meetings of the International Monetary Fund and I had the good fortune to uh, leave before the ceremonies and the big demonstrations that created such a turmoil for my colleagues there. Uh, the uh, globalization has become a word, uh, <clears throat> another word for it uh, that might be used in another sense because it captures part of it, uh, of, the, of the, some aspects of what people want to say is negative about it, Americanization. Um, the, a lot, part of the world don't like the idea of, of globalization because globalization in part means Americanization, the use of the internet, the, uh, uh, which, which la English is the language of the internet, and the uh, uh, fact of opening up each country to uh, free capital movements, allowing um, whole processes of production to be, uh, to be affected. Uh, and changing culture and, and society in uh, unpredictable ways. And th this is the negative aspect of it that we look upon. The, gr the positive aspect of it, though, is that it um, presents the opportunity for tremendous far-reaching increases in the gains from trade. And um, in the long run, globalization is going to come about. We're, we're living in a world where uh, technology has increased, uh, decreased transport costs and uh, increased the speed of communications to such a high pitch that it's at a, a very uh, important uh, stage. However, I'm going to talk, and this is not unconnected with the subject of my lecture, about um, uh, some of the big defects of the international monetary system, some of the big defects of the world economy which uh, create and allow uh, the, the more harmful aspects of globalization from uh, uh, rearing their uh, ugly heads. Now, the third point I want to make is, uh, uh, to mention, is the uh, U.S. economic miracle. For the past two decades, the U.S. economy has been the backbone of the economic growth in the world economy. Uh, it's very different from the period uh, immediately after World War II, when uh, Europe and Japan were soaring ahead at unprecedented speeds, high growth, low employment, low inflation, and, and uh, uh, 
uh, uh, very successful uh, economies. Whereas the United States was struggling in a way with a kind of stagnation, they couldn't get unemployment rates down. But in the past two decades, uh, the shoe is on the other foot that uh, it's the European economies that have been stagnating. They've gotten into difficulties. They've had excessive inflation, excessive um, uh, increases in their public debts, um, and relatively high unemployment and very relatively low economic growth. The source of that growth in the United States uh, really began with a revolution uh, of the 1980s in the tax system in the United States. Uh, in the um, <clears throat> If you think back, uh, those of you who are a little, <laughs> a little um, old enough to, to 1980, uh, the, uh, in 1980, the marginal tax rates were 70% at the federal level, 70% at the federal level alone. The marg top marginal tax bracket was 70%. Uh, and if you added state and local tax rates to that in a high tax state like uh, the one where I live in New York, it's another 15%. So the marginal tax rate was very, very high. At the same time, in 1980, there was a 13% inflation in the United States. And unemployment was around 5 or 6%. It wasn't very uh, extremely high, but it was much below, be above what economists thought the economy was capable of. So you had high inflation, relatively high uh, employment, growth was very low, was stagnating, and uh, tax rates were extremely high. The corporate tax rate was 48%. Uh, um, now, uh, eight years later, when, when Reagan uh, was elected, and Paul Volcker shifted course in monetary policy toward a new policy mix. Instead of easy money inflating uh, and lowering the value of the dollar internationally and domestically, uh, you had tight money. Instead of increasing tax rates caused not directly from programs that, that legislated an increase in tax rates, but through the fact that with a steeply progressive income tax system, coupled with inflation of, in 1980 of 13%, people were being shifted into higher and higher income tax brackets. And so the uh, uh, um, Reaganomics came to be characterized as uh, very steep cuts in tax rates, uh, combined with tight money to keep the economy in, in motion. And what, after a series of several measures, including indexing the uh, tax brackets for inflation, uh, by at the time Ronald Reagan left office, the top marginal tax rate at the federal level was no longer 70 percent, it was 28 percent. And the uh, corporate tax rate had been lowered from 48 percent to 34 percent. And that made the U.S. economy the most efficient in the world, and you had a period from after an initial recession from 1982 until 1990 where 19 million jobs had been created, a great success story. Now, that period ended in 1990 with uh, a nine-month recession. But after that nine-month recession in the spring of 1991, the economy expanded again. And we were still in the expansion that began in the middle of 1990. So we have now a Bush, a Clinton, Gore expansion, if you like, uh, all through the 1990s. It's added to the um, to the um, Reagan-Bush expansion of the 1980s. So just from 1982, from the recession of 1982 to the present time, there's been no less than 40 million new jobs created. That's more than the entire labor force of the third largest economy in the world, the German economy. And that is a great success story. And recently, things have been getting even better because with the new economy, uh, when economists were arguing about can we have a two and a half, more than a two and a half percent long run growth rate, maybe we can have a three and a half percent growth rate. I was pushing for that. Suddenly, we've suddenly got into a four and a half percent, even five percent growth rates when we add and figure into it the, the tremendous uh, contributions from uh, the new technology and, uh, and the inter internet technology, international technology. So uh, uh, there's, uh, n now we're still in this in this expansion, uh, the longest expansion in American history. 
If you think of the 20th century, just looking at the 20th century, all the big expansions have been in the 20th century. The first was 1938 to 1945, wartime expansion. The second was the Kennedy Johnson expansion, starting in 1963 and 64 with the tax cuts that were put on at, at that time. The Kennedy Johnson tax cut was passed in 1964. A big expansion in the 19, uh, 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 60s, and then the third big expansion was the, the uh, and the second big overall was the Reagan Bush expansion of the 1980s, and now we're in the biggest expansion ever. So it's a, a period of great growth, and that has been backstopping the American, the world economy. And at a time when Japan has been sluggish, and when Europe has been sluggish, uh, Europe is uh, getting its act together, of course, with the. Uh, with the uh, uh, euro, and I'll, I'll say a word or two about that uh, in a moment. The, uh, uh, the fourth factor I want to m mention is this, the new capitalism. All around the world now, and I think it started probably with the Milken revolution of junk bonds, buying and selling junk bonds, suddenly uh, now uh, corporations Corporations, companies have become commodities. They're bought and sold here and there, and part of their companies are bought and sold. They're split up and changed around. That's also part of the corporation, the the internet revolution. Because uh, now, what uh, companies can do is they can look inside and see what parts of the company are contributing, how much, what their contribution to the profit stream is, and which are making losses. And they can separate them and find new synergies with other corporations. You get getting now, uh, uh, with global capitalism, uh, the optimum size of the firm is larger. And uh, you're getting mergers, companies are getting bigger and bigger, fewer and fewer, in, because we're now not thinking in terms of commanding the domestic market, but commanding the world market. And that's true also in banking, particularly in Europe, where the, the tall, biggest bank in Europe is small, very small, compared to the biggest bank relative to its own market in the United States. Deutsche Bank is the biggest bank in Europe, merged with Bankers Trust, but it's still small relative to the size of the biggest American banks and the big Japanese banks. So much more of that is going to come, and it's been made uh, it, within Europe itself uh, uh, very important by the advent of the euro, the locking of exchange rates of several countries. Well, then that we get then to the fifth uh, important factor, the advent of the euro, and what is the significance of it? It's certainly a big change in the international monetary system. And some observers have said that uh, it's an important change that's com comparable to the breakdown uh, of the international monetary system, the Bretton Woods arrangements in the early 1970s. But in an important sense, it's deeper than that. Because uh, in the, the 1970s breakdown, we had a fixed exchange rate system after the war. That broke down in the early 70s, and we moved to flexible exchange rates. But it didn't change the power configuration of the system. Before and after that breakdown, uh, the US dollar was the dominant currency in the world. And now the advent of the euro creates the possibility of at least a change in that, at least is the possibility of that change. So I think that the advent of the euro is comparable to the period in World War I when the dollar, the US dollar, took over from the pound sterling as the most important currency in the world. Well, how, how important is the uh, euro? Uh, it, so much has been focused on the fall of the euro, uh, the fact that it's uh, gone down from started out being worth a dollar 18, and then it hit as low as uh, 84, a little above 84 cents, a uh, big uh, sweeping uh, depreciation of, um, of something like 28% in two years, one and a half, less than two years. A very big uh, change. But remember, we do have a floating exchange rate system, and volatility of exchange rates has characterized that system. I'm going to spend time talking about that in my, my the subject of my lecture, remember, is does the world need a go global currency? And uh, I'm going to say yes to that question. But we have a flexible exchange rate system that the uh, 
international powers that be, including the International Monetary Fund and its Board of Governors, are insisting on. Uh, uh, we, we have volatility, and that's, that focus, though, on, uh, on the rate itself uh, and I know when I was last Friday, or the, the Friday of, when I was speaking in Prague, that very Friday, the central banks of the G7 countries all intervened in order to uh, stabilize the, uh, to put a floor to the euro, or at least to intervene and try to affect that exchange rate. That was quite significant because they, that recognized that it, um, uh, it the exchange rate of the euro against the dollar and against the yen and the pound uh, is an important international concern. It's not just a concern of a single country. Well, when the euro was created, beginning of 1999, it instantly became the number two currency in the world. And that's what gives it importance from the standpoint of the power configuration of the system. When you think of power in the system, it's like you think of monetary mass. How big is the total amount of transactions carried on by uh, one currency? Uh, the best measure we have of that would be proportional to uh, uh, GDP, gross domestic product. The US, uh, in round numbers, the US GDP is about $10 trillion. The, uh, GDP of the Euro 11 countries is about $7 trillion. The GDP of Japan is about $5 trillion. So you get a sense of the proportion and the role of those uh, economies by those numbers. Uh, you can think of these three areas, the dollar area, the Euro area, and the N area as together comprising 60 percent, 50 to 60 percent of the world economy. They represent really the core of the world economy. And anything that happens to the structure of the international monetary system has to uh, ipso facto take account of what is happening among exchange rates of these, of these areas. Well, um, the, the static levels of GDPs give an an indication of the current strength of those currencies and importance of those currencies. But if you look down the road over the next 10 years and you see expansion, all the areas could in principle be expanding. Uh, the euro area is expanding. Um, the, uh, there are three countries, uh, Greece has joined, it's, the EU 11 is going to be at the end of the year, the EU 12 soon because Greece will be locked into the exchange rate system after uh, the beginning of the year. Uh, three countries have stayed out, including Denmark, Sweden, and uh, Britain. Of these countries, the British case is by far the most important because Britain has a big uh, possibility of influencing the rest of the uh, system. But the Danes, um, Denmark just had its referendum last week and decided no, they didn't want uh, uh, they didn't want to join. They said, uh, uh, I guess 46% of them said uh, no to joining the European Monetary Union and uh, uh, said yes to it and 54% or so said no to it. Uh, to me, <clears throat> this uh, uh, is because the issue was put to the Danes more or less as a, an economic issue is a pure economic basis and uh, the cost of giving up for them of, of joining EMU is that they'll have to give up the beloved crown and uh, they've had that crown for 700 years or so and, and that has a lot of nostalgic to it. Now the crown they had though 700 years ago was very different from the crown that they have today. This is a paper crown, it's not like the gold or silver crowns that existed in the past so it has a different sort of meaning. Nevertheless uh, you must realize that um, money is part of the sovereignty. There's a monetary sovereignty that is a component of sovereignty in a country, and the monetary system of a country is part of its monetary heritage. I would never want to say that's not the case. I would never want Americans or Englishmen or Canadians to think that their money and the way they treated it and used their monetary systems in the past is not an important part of their heritage and their tradition. But in the case of uh, the uh, Denmark, uh, Denmark has 
gained, become such a rich country by its uh, ability to join the Eurozone. Uh, and the issue was put as if this is a pure economic deal. But without any consideration, perhaps it was too delicate to bring up the real issue uh, and the real motivation as to why the Maastricht Treaty was signed so quickly in 1991. It was tie to tie Germany, uh, a unified Germany, a newly unified Germany into Western Europe so that uh, uh, the, uh, uh, w w the Europe wouldn't have to face the problem, and Germany wouldn't have to face the problem either of the tendency of the German economy and the German political system to dominate Europe. And uh, I think that, uh, that when Denmark signed the Treaty of Maastricht, uh, they, that included provision for uh, a monetary union and the, they recognized the importance of, of that EMU, monetary union, in Europe and tying Germany into it. Well, when the other countries, the 11 countries, went ahead with it, it became a done deal for them. Uh, now Denmark can say out, say, well, we don't need to, we don't need to take part in this venture of tying Germany into the rest of Europe because the other countries are all doing it. So they can play the role of the free rider and, and say out. I think it's a question, uh, morally a very uh, questionable policy. And I hope that Sweden doesn't follow the same uh, wrong policy itself. Although Sweden has much more of a neutralist uh, t uh, tradition than, than Denmark does. And, uh, and, and Sweden, of course, didn't suffer uh, at the hands of uh, the Nazis uh, the way Denmark did. So I think those political aspects are, are important. Now, I, uh, I do think that all that's going to change and that uh, uh, because I've been told by <clears throat> but from people in the Danish parliament that the next vote referendum that the uh, Danes will have is uh, to either accept EMU or leave the EU that is, get out of the common market treaty and get out of the whole thing. Either all out or all in, that may be the case. And uh, if that's the case, then the Danes will vote to go in, all in, because uh, they've become so wealthy f as a result of gl their own version of continental globalization that has made, got them those uh, tremendous increases in the gains from trade. Well, more important than that is that uh, in when the, once the bilateral exchange rates were locked, and then in 1999 they were all exchange rates were fixed to the um, uh, euro, the new euro, which was founded on the old ECU, the basket of the other of the European currencies. Uh, immediately, 13 other countries in Africa were also locked to that zone. Uh, because the CFA franc countries, there are 13 of them, that were formerly locked to the French franc are now locked to the euro. So there's really uh, 25 countries now in the eurozone. And there are 13 other countries invited to apply for admission to the EU, uh, which counts uh, Turkey, which may or may not come in so early, but the other countries apart from Turkey are quite likely to be in by the next, uh, by the end of the decade, and uh, the chances that they will all be in the Eurozone is very high. So we're talking about 40 countries in the Eurozone in the next uh, while, and there's probably some countries in North Africa, in the Middle East, and in Eastern Europe, uh, up, up outside the, the 13 Central European countries, and counting Malta and, and Cyprus also, that will be linked to the zone. So we're talking about 40 to 50 countries in the Eurozone in 10 years, with a population anywhere from 450 to 500 million people, and a GDP of that area that uh, will probably be 10, 20, 30 percent higher than that of the United States. So uh, in 10 years' time, the euro area is going to vie with the dollar, and uh, maybe central banks will want to keep their reserves about equally in dollars and euros within about 10 years. If they're going to do that, though, it, they have to start building that up soon because the, um, uh, right now most reserves are in U.S. dollars. So uh, to think ahead to a city-state equilibrium where it was about equal, maybe 40% of world reserves are in dollars, 40% in euros, and 20% other currencies in the year 2010 or 2012, uh, 
then we'll have about three, over three trillion uh, dollars worth of reserves. Then uh, there'll be that would would could only be achieved with the buildup of something like um, um, hundred billion dollars a year of euros, somehow to get to over a trillion dollars of uh, reserves by 2010 or 2012. And uh, that would change trade balances and have a big thing. But that pent up demand means that as soon as people think that the euro has hit bottom and central banks think that the euro has hit bottom and the dollar does start to fall as it will fall when the growth rate of the United States tapers down a little bit. Then when the dollar falls, immediately the biggest current account deficits in history, uh, in any country's history, that we have now a current account deficit and a trade balance deficit, call it the same thing, uh, of over $400 billion will become very important. That'll be an issue to finance. And the capital that's coming in now to finance that $400 billion won't be there if the dollars starts to fall. There'll be a movement to diversification. And, and then that's a, the threat then would be the other, um, would be the other way, that not that the euro is going to go down too much, but that it'll shoot way up. And that would be an embarrassment and a difficulty for Europe as well, as well as for the United States. And that's why I think and why I said in the uh, Prague meeting that um, that what uh, the central bank intervention is a good thing to put a floor to the euro, and every economist in the world thinks that the euro has now got, got down to uh, a really a low, far, no one thinks that it should go down uh, by any economic theory lower than it is now. It's a floor at 85 cents and a ceiling to allow for this possible problem in the future of 115 cents. And it would be easy to fix that and it would be a clear-cut intervention that would be, would be uh, uh, maintainable in the long run. So uh, anyway, um, we have three islands of stability in the system. Make no mistake about it. The dollar area, the euro area, and the yen area uh, are islands of stability in the sense that the purchasing power of the euro over euro goods, dollar over dollar goods, and the yen over dollar over yen goods uh, is stable. The inflation rate in Europe is below 3%. The inflation rate in the United States is below 3% or near 3%. And the inflation rate in, in Japan is 2 or 3%, or even less than that. It's even closer to zero. And in, for a while, it's been even falling a little bit. The fact is that each of these three currencies are stable in terms of an important basket of goods. So the question that you have to ask then, if the currencies are stable in terms of uh, a given basket of goods, why aren't the currencies stable in terms of each other? What's the function of the uh, volatility of exchange rates? How volatile have these rates been? And can you predict the euro in the future as being as volatile as its predecessors? Well, uh, we've only a year and a half or a year and nine months to look at the euro, but uh, we have the predecessor of the uh, euro, which was the ECU, and the backbone of the ECU was the Deutschmark. And so we can look at Deutschmark dollar rates to see how volatile the system has been. 19, um, for all the post-war period, uh, the um, a, a dollar against the mark ever since the German currency reform in 1948 was 4.2 marks to the dollar. Then 1961, there was a little tiny change in it to four marks to the dollar. But then by the middle of 1975, the dollar had got down to three and a half marks, 1975. Five years later, the dollar fell in half to about 1.7 marks. That was when the American inflation rate was going up and the dollar was depreciating. From 1975 to 1980, the dollar fell in half from 3.5 to 1.7 marks. But then came Reaganomics, 1980 to 1985, the dollar soared to 3.4 marks, it doubled. 75 to 80, the dollar fell in half. 
1980 to 85, the dollar doubled. And then in the next seven years, the dollar did more than fall in a half. It went from 3.4 down to uh, below 1.4. A sweeping change. It, by 1992, in the pit of the ERM crisis of that year, uh, the dollar was below 1.4. And, uh, and then now the dollar is like 2.2. So you have these huge swings, doubling, falling in half, doubling and falling in half, 100% changes in exchange rates. Just imagine what would happen to the dollar, to Europe, if the dollar-euro rate started to double against the dollar and then fall in half against the dollar and double again and then fall in half against. And why should it take place between two areas that have price stability? There's, a, as Keynes knew, Keynes knew that if a country, if the rest of the world is unstable, you should never fix exchange rates to it, to an unstable world because that would not give domestic stability, internal stability. But if the rest of the world is stable, then you can have both exchange rate stability and price stability. And uh, uh, that's what we need to do. What about the yen? Uh, for, Japan had a currency conversion in 1948 too, just like the United States. It wasn't an accident because they were both under American occupation and the Americans decided to do it. And it was a brilliant stroke of luck for both economies because it set both the German and the Japanese economies to be the outstanding stars of the post-war period that gave them monetary stability and they kept going. But for the whole post-war period, the dollar was 360 yen. Then by 1985, the dollar had got down to 250 yen. But in the next 10 years, uh, to 1995, the dollar went from 250 yen to 79 yen, 1995, April 1995. And then between 1895, 1995 and 19, June 1998, the dollar soared to 148 yen. People said, oh, it's going to go up to 200 yen. The speculators were saying that. It didn't. It went down to 105 yen, more or less like that. But there you have this wild stability of exchange rates in a period when you had comparable price stability in these two economies. And don't think that that wasn't a world-shaking event because the appreciation of the dollar against the uh, yen from 1995 to 1998, or if you like, want to put it, the depreciation of the yen against the dollar, was what was 90% of the cause of the Asian crisis. All those currencies that had latched onto the dollar around 1995, and then their currencies soared against the yen, they became uncompetitive, and then with the uh, yen uh, flopping around, falling down, Japan stopped investing in, um, in Southeast Asia, and this is what uh, brought on the uh, basic crisis. So these, this exchange rate volatility creates instability in the world, and I, I, I could go on, I could, I could argue, as I have uh, many times before, that the instability of the exchange rates between in the 1970s and 1980s created the debt crisis for the developing countries. The big uh, overly expansive expansionary policies when um, Euro-dollar banks were shoving money at the less developed countries and then combined that e when interest rates were very low, real interest rates were even negative, and then suddenly when Reaganomics came along, Paul Volcker tightened the United States. It had to get back to its own monetary stability, but it was a devastating impact and created the debt crisis that emerged in the 1980s for those countries. So uh, this, uh, is, uh, this is tragic for the world economy, the volatility of exchange rates. Could you do anything about it. Well, let's suppose that you took, uh, you, you took away your, um, your political uh, cynicism for a moment and just suppose, ab abstracted from politics of it. Suppose that uh, we'll call them the G3 countries, uh, the uh, United States, 
Euro land or the Euro area and the, and the N area. These are the G3 areas. Uh, suppose they decide, let's do what 11 European countries did. Let's lock exchange rates. Let's lock exchange rates and have a monetary union. Now, let me say this, that when the 11 countries locked exchange rates, when they, they locked them in the uh, middle of 1998, bilaterally, and then they locked them to the euro in, in January 1999. The moment they locked exchange rates, speculative capital movements between Germany, France, uh, Spain, uh, Italy completely disappeared. There was no speculation one way or the other because people, those locked exchange rates were credible and nobody speculated against them. Well, let's suppose you could do the same thing among the G3 areas. Just take a skip of the imagination. Uh, uh, would you do the same thing that the 11 countries did? Now, how, what did they do? What was necessary uh, in creating that uh, monetary union in Europe? There were five things they had to do. Uh, the five things were <clears throat> they first had to have a common inflation target. You can't have a monetary union if uh, one area has a different inflation target than, uh, than the other. If, uh, if Japan wants zero inflation, the United States wants 3% inflation, they can't have a monetary union. But let's suppose they can agree on a common inflation target. And then the second thing they need is a common way to measure inflation in the common the three areas. Uh, you, need, uh, you can't have national baskets of goods or area-specific baskets of goods. You have to have the same weights in all the indexes in order to measure the inflation in the common area. Just as the Eurostat, the statistics version of the um, Bureau of Statistics in the United States, uh, in Europe, uh, created what they call the uh, HICP, the Harmonized Index of Consumer Prices. So that gives them a way of measuring inflation in the common area. Uh, then number three, th they need to have, um, they need to lock exchange rates. If they're going to keep the currencies, if they're keeping three currencies, they have to lock exchange rates. Now, uh, the way to do that is, is, there are different ways you could do it, but it's certainly easier if you choose one cent, one area as the leader it's easier to choose the biggest area as the leader. So suppose the Federal Reserve is the leader and then the Bank of Japan is assigned to lock exchange rates to the um, United States, to the dollar. Hopefully at, at 100 yen equals the dollar, it would make it very convenient. And if Europe would lock exchange rates to the dollar, hopefully at one, that would be a very ni nice measure, but it may not be possible in the short term. Lock exchange, and then monetary policy would be carried out by open market purchases of, uh, on the part of the uh, Federal Reserve System in the, uh, in the financial assets of either Europe or the United States or Japan. And the people, the open market committee would have to be composed of the Japanese, the Europeans, and the Americans. And they'd make the decisions uh, about whether to expand or contract, raise or lower interest rates, just as every three weeks the Open Market Committee makes those decisions today. And they'd fight about it. They'd be bickering about whether they should go up or down, and there'd be a division of opinion, but they'd reach a decision about it. And you would end up with a monetary union. The fifth thing they'd have to do is to make an agreement about redistributing senior reach from monetary expansion, as the Europeans do it. They do it, uh, they redistribute senior reads, the profits from monetary expansion uh, in proportion to the stock that each country holds in the, in the central bank. More or less the size of the country is the important thing. So that get, gives, it, right. Well, you could have that kind of monetary union. If, if you thought that would be difficult, instead have a single currency monetary union as Europe is about to have after 2000, the middle of 2002, a single currency monetary union. Then you'd have one exchange rate, it would be, a, you'd have a common central bank, a combination of the three central banks, and one decision-making process comprised of different groups making a decision to expand or contract. You'd have zero volatility in exchange rates. You'd have 
unfortunately for some, zero profits for the hedge funds. Hedge funds have go up now to, um, assets in hedge funds go up now to $20 trillion in the total amount. Just huge amounts. Two um, daily turnover in the cross-border transactions is something like one and a half to two trillion dollars per day in turnover, just based on exchange rate uncertainty. You could limit, and the cost of that it goes up into the hundreds of billions of dollars in terms of lost welfare. If you could lock exchange rates and you could uh, you either have a common currency or just lock exchange rates and do the same thing that Europe is doing at the present time, then you would, there'd be a tremendous saving here and uh, all that would happen for the poor hedge fund operators, some, some of which are uh, students of mine and they've complained to me when I, they complain to me when I say things like this, uh, that they would have to move into more productive endeavors. But there's no reason, no reason for the world economy to be saddled with those. Uh, mind you, make no mistake about it, I'm not against or opposed to what the hedge funds are doing now. I'm not blaming them. They're just trying to make the best of a, of a very rotten system in the world economy. I'm suggesting we change the system in the world economy. Now, um, uh, what... Uh, uh, as you go on, you, uh, uh, what about the rest of the world? Well, uh, if you had those exchange rates of the dollar, yen, and euro rates locked together, uh, a great part of the problems of the rest of the world would be taken care of. Many, many countries might want to fix on to that, uh, that area and uh, they'd find that if, if a basket of goods of those three countries, j areas, Japan, the United States, and, and Europe were uh, keeping their, if, if, if the, those currencies were stable in terms of it, the other countries could um, keep their currencies fixed in terms of that too. Now, other countries may choose to do their own, to be independent. Uh, the president of Brazil last April uh, suggested that maybe Mercosur needs a, a currency of its own, a Mercosur currency. Uh, Mercosur is that combination of four countries in South America, very different sizes, Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay and Paraguay. Uruguay and Paraguay are very small, three and four million people. Uh, Argentina has 35 million people and Brazil has 160 million. So it's a dominated uh, system in a way, except that if uh, Argentina didn't go along with it, it wouldn't happen. But if Argentina and Brazil got together, it would probably happen. Uh, I, when I, I was down there last spring asking what, um, what should happen for those, uh, uh, what kind of, uh, what do they have in mind about the common currency? And I had made some su uh, suggestions about how they might get toward that, uh, toward a Mercosur currency. Uh, it turns out that uh, what the Brazilians were thinking of mainly was using <laughs> the Brazilian real <laughs> as the currency for all the countries, which would be a, a, about as, was about as popular an idea as using the Deutsche Mark in Europe for the common currency. After all, uh, Hitler had a chance with the Deutsche Mark in, uh, in, uh, in the 1940s. And the Deutsche Mark was the common currency once in Europe, but it was run by Hitler and that didn't work out very well. Uh, but anyway, there's, uh, m m the, m m people are exploring this sort of idea. And um, uh, recently um, uh, in Asia, I was talking in places like uh, in Malaysia, Jeffrey Sachs was there at the same conference in Singapore and in uh, Indonesia. And um, uh, the, the great deal of interest in the question, does Asia need uh, a common currency? And uh, that was what the subject of, uh, of a speech there. And my answer to that was that, well, yes, Asia needs a common currency, so on, but it can't be a single currency like the European currency. Europe has gone for a single currency. The strict is the most complete form of monetary integration, patterning itself almost after the United States, the Federal Reserve. 
but they could only do that because a high degree of political integration has already been attempted and achieved within Europe, and because Europe has become a security area. You can't have a single currency uh, in a group of countries which, where there's still a possibility that there might be war between the countries. A security area is an area where war is ruled out. That's happened. Germany and France have buried the hatchet, so to speak, and so war is ruled out in Europe. A single currency is possible. In Asia, that's not possible yet. But there's still, um, with many, some of the countries still reeling from the um, problems of the so-called Asian crisis, uh, then um, uh, this, uh, uh, they, they are looking for something new, something important, and it's difficult to create an Asian currency right now, uh, like Europe, because of the problems between the straits with uh, Taiwan and China, the problems between Japan and China, and the dominance of Japan economically, and uh, the strength and, and potential growing military power of China. It creates uh, difficulties, and yet the need is very, uh, is very great there. Uh, in Indonesia has had a very uh, difficult um, case, um, a very unstable economy, and yet Indonesia is so important to this whole area because it's a country of 200 million people in that area, the biggest, uh, af the, the biggest in population, uh, not counting India, but after, after China in this area. Uh, and, um, but the problem is still that Indonesia still has a currency crisis. And if I may just take uh, uh, precious time for, for a little story that was running around Indonesia, it goes like this, that uh, God calls for three world leaders and tells them that he's really annoyed with all the problems the world gives him and has decided to destroy the planet in three days. Clinton goes back to Washington and tells his people, I have good news and bad news. The good news is that there is God, and the bad news is that we have goofed up and the world will end in three days. Jiang Jimin returns to the PRC, China, and tells his people, I have bad news and worse news. The bad news is that there is a God, and the worst news is that he's going to stop our plan for world domination in three days. <laughs> Gus Dur, as they affectionately call uh, President Wahid of Indonesia, returns to Indonesia with a big smile and says, I have good news and better news. The good news is that God thinks I am one of the three most important people in the world. <laughs> the better news is the currency crisis will be over in three days. <laughs> they, <laughs> they, uh, they do have a problem. Uh, and uh, now the solution to that problem uh, would be, of course, if the, the, Latin America has a problem, Africa has a problem, every country, every part of the world has a problem, North America has a problem. There are many people thinking that there should be a North American uh, uh, monetary union. Uh, the president-elect of Mexico, Vintende Fox, just came, has come around talking about that, and he was actually rather uh, sharply rebuffed in Canada from it by uh, the Prime Minister, uh, Jean Chrétien, and said, no, we don't even hear anything about a monetary union in Canada, because the Quebecois actually have been proposing that the Canadian dollar be fixed to the American dollar, or that the Canadians start to use the American dollar rather than their own, as being in the long run more stable. But, the, but there's still a need to think about it, and everybody wants to think about it. Well, the, um, solution would be to do what uh, was originally planned uh, 46 years ago at the Bretton Woods Conference in New Hampshire. 
1944 in New Hampshire. There were two major plans. This was this big conference which set up ultimately the IMF, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank was set up uh, in order to uh, get away from the currency problems that existed after World War I, which were quite uh, uh, terrible uh, in unstable currency conditions. They wanted a post-war world that would be stable. And there were two plans that were being discussed. One was the British plan, which is really done by John Maynard Keynes, uh, and which had a plan for a world currency, a world currency called Bancor, and a kind of world central bank and an overdraft system. Uh, the other plan was the American plan, largely written up by uh, Harry Dexter White, and uh, it had a plan for a world currency called Unitas, and it was a kind of a system where you would uh, contribute, get over, you'd, you'd, you'd be able to draw on the on the new institution. They called it the fund, not the bank. Draw on the fund. You'd put in your own currency and take out. Uh, currencies that you needed in the exchange markets. But both these plans initially had a world currency. And then some, somehow or other, in the negotiations and the discussion of it, uh, the United States decided they did not want a world currency. The United States did not want a world currency, and they withdrew that from their plan. And whenever the British, like L Lord Robbins, Lionel Robbins, tried to bring up the subject of the world currency, what about this? The um, Americans changed the subject and uh, didn't want to talk about it. And so the, the issue was dropped. If the Americans didn't want it, it wouldn't happen. I suppose the Americans thought that the gold, gold and or the dollar would suffice in the future. But you see what happened 25 years later, gold and the dollar took separate, went on separate ways. The dominance of the United States was so, so great, economy, that it elbowed out gold from the system. We, no, we lost, we were no longer on the gold standard or even close to it because the dollar became easier to use and that elbowed out gold in the system. And then uh, we moved on to, the world moved on to floating exchange rates because the United States was quite happy to go with floating exchange rates. After all, the United States currency area is so vast and huge, it's like a world of its own. The US currency area today is 10 times bigger in terms of monetary transactions than the whole world was 100 years ago. So vast is this, so the United States could do without it, but the small countries didn't, do, didn't like it and couldn't do without it, and they tried to cope with it, accept it, cope with it. Did with it. Europe said, well, at least we'll go our own separate way and try to create a currency area of our own as a second best solution. But our first best solution would be uh, to have a world currency. And how could you do that? And I'll just, just say this rather quickly. Uh, it would be very easy to do. Uh, I wrote about this somewhat in a Wall Street Journal article on March the 30th, an op-ed page article. But if you got this G3 monetary union going, it could be keeping the three G3 currencies, but then created an instrument that was equal to um, a dollar or ten dollars, let's say, a thousand yen and a proportionate number of euros, you met an, an independent uh, uh, global money, like the Bancor of Keynes, like the Unitas of the American plan back in 1944, that was equivalent to the either the yen or uh, the dollar or a hundred yen or uh, 90 or a hundred uh, euros. And then that you let that become the unit of account and then let that be produced by the international monetary system as a whole, the, uh, the fund or some new organization created like that, and let all the rest of the world fix their currencies onto that. And then you'd get back to the fixed exchange rate system uh, that the Bretton Woods uh, arrangements uh, tried to create, but you'd get back to it with a, a global currency, and that global currency would be, uh, 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 would then, uh, have a stability of value 
just the same as the stability of value of that G3 monetary union, and that uh, would be a unit of account that could be endorsed by all the members of the fund and would be uh, an approach that uh, would be, um, uh, uh, would be a great catalyst for world peace, and uh, it would be a help to all the individual countries in the area. So um, don't think for a moment that uh, it's so unrealistic as it may sound at first. Uh, not only do we have the past experience of it, 2,000 years ago, uh, in the reign of Caesar Augustus, there was a universal money, gold, the golden aureus. A thousand years ago, there was a universal money, the solidus of the bezant of Constantinople. And a hundred years ago, at the time Nobel was creating his uh, Nobel Prizes, there was a world money, it was gold. Notice that, that um, um, in the past, you, you, to see how, if you just re think of the Nobel Prizes, they give a nice sum of money uh, to the, uh, to the um, awardees. They were in gold before. Uh, and they were in, in gold crowns of Sweden, and then the crowns. But look what happened. Look how rapidly they've increased in paper crowns. Now they're 7.9 million or something like that. 7.9 million crowns. Uh, at a time back in the, uh, uh, in the early days, you could fix them in terms of gold, and you would keep them constant, because as long as gold was constant, there was uh, some at least reasonable constancy of purchasing power. Now they have to go up and up and up and increase it with the inflation rate, and there's, it would be much better to be able to price uh, to have for all international uh, deals a common currency that's not the national currency, and there's a great need for it. Uh, the, uh, in the February issue, in February of uh, in the New York Times, uh, one fe this February, last February, uh, Paul Volcker did answer this very question that a global economy, he says it does need a global currency. Uh, he was the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, one of the most effective chairmen that the United States has had, and he believes that that's necessary. A large number of, growing number of people start to believe that that there's a great deal wrong with the excessive currency volatility of the system. We have to find a way of working to, um, uh, to eliminate it. So uh, I conclude then with my thought, with the answer to the question, yes, the world does need a, a global currency. The global economy does need a global currency. And do I think we're going to get one? Well, I do think that in the next decade or two, there'll be a very large step in this direction because I think all over the world now, people have realized uh, that over the 1990s, the instability of the 1970s under floating rates, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, debt crisis of the 1980s, the uh, uh, currency crisis of the 1990s from Mexico to Argentina to um, um, uh, to the Asian crisis has indicated that we're dealing with a dysfunctional system, this volatility, and that the best solution for it is for a coherent, more coherent policy at the center of the international monetary system, and the key point in that would be the creation of a world currency. Thank you.
this point. Sure. Voice is here. Hi, Bob. Hi. Hey, good How to see you. Good yeah. to see you. Nice to uh, be with you. Again. We've invited the panelists up for questions. Uh, write your questions on the sheet of paper and the ushers will bring them to you. I have a quick announcement before we begin here. Uh, because of the inclement weather, yes it is raining out there, the complimentary coffee and hot cider that was scheduled for outside has been moved indoors to the Lund Center Forum. That would be through this door and in the building to the left of us here. Uh, this is where some of you had bag lunches for lunch, and more of you would have had it there if we would have told you where to find them. We're sorry about that. Okay. Once again, we will uh, begin our lecture response by taking comments or questions from the other members of our panel. While those comments and responses are being addressed by Dr. Mandel, we will uh, also be collecting questions from the audience. If you have questions you would like to pose for Dr. Mandel, you may pass those to the passing ushers who are out there. We would uh, like to get this portion of the program underway at this time, so if you'll please take a seat. Again, our responses from the panel, I'll call on Michael Tsoma. Mr. Solon. Well, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Mandel, I would like to, um, to make a comment about your description of the Euro and the Danish uh, election or referendum, but in more general terms. As I see it, uh, there is a credibility gap. Uh, the Euro has, was launched with such promises uh, of success even of uh, promises or threats against the dollar. When the euro would squeeze out the dollar uh, and, and such talk, uh, which uh, has not been substantiated by, by uh, the events. Uh, that's one thing. The, the second is uh, there is a credibility gap within the EU against Brussels. 
and there are some quite serious questions of democratic transparency and control, accountability, which sooner or later will have to be addressed in a serious way. And that has not been done. And what we have seen in, in, uh, in Denmark is a very respectable turnout, some slightly below 90% of the population which went to the referendum. And if you're a Democrat, or democratically inclined, you have respect for such an outturn, irrespective of your position. And what we see is a reaction against the elite in Denmark and, and at the European level. And if you go to, to Germany, as far as I know, the opinion polls are not very positive to the Euro uh, at present. Now this is for, for sort of the, the democratic dimension. Then you have the, the market dimension, or the capitalist dimension. You, and here comes my question. You said that, uh, yes, uh, the, um, we have three areas of stability and in terms of inflation rate. Nonetheless, one of these three parties loses 25% or whatever it is in value towards the dollar. Uh, well, what, what is the main explanation for this uh, development? Uh, if uh, the expectations are that the, the, um, uh, the inflation rates will uh, converge, there would be no reason for, for such a movement. Uh, but we had it. I have my explanation, but I would be interested to listen to your. Uh, how come uh, that the capital markets showed such distrust to, towards the euro? Euro uh, was created and it had uh, started off with the value of um, uh, $1.18. Uh, uh, a lot of people were very happy that it fell because uh, prior to that, a, a lot of people have been saying that the uh, big danger is that the Euro will be strong. It will be like the Deutschmark and it will uh, push up and make the uh, European currencies more overvalued than they were to start with. And uh, at the same time, uh, there were people like uh, uh, Mr. Lafontaine in the uh, German Parliament, Mr. F uh, Finance, who was advocating expansion or using the central bank to uh, solve the problem of European unemployment. And Mr. Prodi in Italy had been saying something similar, that the resources of foreign exchange reserves should be spent to increase employment. So uh, when the euro fell to toward a uh, dollar ten or a dollar five, then it uh, looked as if that completely undercut those arguments, and that really was a very good thing for Europe, and I think uh, it was a good thing for the German economy, and it uh, was all that. But as it, uh, the euro did go down, as it started to sink below parity with the dollar, it uh, uh, started to raise deeper questions of why was the euro falling, and you could uh, list a large number of them. I had done this before the euro came into being uh, in uh, 1998. It listed uh, six liquidity factors that would uh, affect the euro when it was created, uh, four of which would make the euro go down, two of which would come along later and make the euro go up. The positive factors were uh, central bank demand in the long run and so on. But the, the initial factor was that when you suddenly replace one currency or 11 currencies with one currency, the one currency mass is much more liquid and effective and productive than the combination of, of the subcomponents. And that it's as if you get a sudden increase in the money supply that would make the euro go down. But there are definitely other factors at work and making it go down more and lack of confidence seemed to be one of them. Uh, one of them, uh, and, and this was a factor that was pushed very much by those who wanted uh, European, um, a, a, a big change in European policies that uh, 
there was discontent that uh, Europe hadn't coped with the problem of its labor markets, that it hadn't got its fiscal house in order, and that it hadn't been even lowering tax rates and deregulating to make the economies more efficient so it would have higher degrees of growth. At the same time, the dollar, the U.S. economy was uh, spreading its wings very rapidly, and that is always a short-run factor that keeps the dollar strong. But I myself think that, uh, and uh, last uh, February, uh, uh, last January even, even in December, I was arguing that the central bank should intervene because, uh, first of all, the euro hadn't been created yet. The euro and paper currency is not there yet. We're still in the transition stage. People, it's, an, an, uh, it's partly an unknown quantity. And there's a great demand for pure currency. If you think of what happened in, the, uh, in December, what was the big thing going on last December? Uh, it was uh, the Y2K problem. Everybody was worried about it. Nobody knew how significant it was going to be or not. But the way in which the United States coped with that problem uh, was by creating 50 billion paper dollars, 50 billion dollars worth of paper, of, of, of paper dollars. Uh, Europe couldn't do that. There was no massive. So the, the way you got this tremendous shift into the dollars, but there's no European currency out there yet, and there won't be until for another year and a half. So, uh, so that's a, a big weakness. And another part of the, another weakness in the euro and causing it to go down, and the, it, Richard Cooper has brought this factor up, that there's nothing in Europe that corresponds to the U.S. Treasury bill, uh, a, a liquid instrument that uh, can easily be, uh, uh, be got. Of course, you can get uh, German Treasury bills and Italian Treasury bills, but there's no Europe-wide instrument, and that's a weakness. And another factor is that uh, with the creation of the euro and the much more liquid, much bigger capital market now in Europe, everybody was rushing into Europe creating euro bonds, and uh, the supply was in excess of the demand. The demand hadn't yet caught up with this, and uh, so what the way that, uh, that affected in the markets is that the euro had to go down until people would be willing to hold these euro-denominated assets. And, but uh, don't ever believe that under the best of circumstances that a free market in exchange rates will ever give you a free market equilibrium. It's not like when you're talking about paper exchange rates of paper currency, there's nothing in economic theory that has ever proved that a, a flexible free market and exchange rates will ever yield anything close to an equilibrium. It's not, a, not an issue of, of private enterprise or government interference. Government is head and shoulders into the money industry. Government monopolizes. The, the, the most socialized industry in the world is the money industry. It's completely controlled by the government, and it's pr not production through any means of, by any competitive process, it's the production of pure paper money, overvalued paper money, and everything depends upon the quantity fixing of the government in terms of the price of that. But there's no basis whatsoever for thinking that a free market and exchange rates would ever give you an optimum position. Let me prove that to you in a moment. Let's suppose that people were talking about flexible exchange rates, and that Milton Friedman was arguing for in the 50s for flexible exchange rates. And, um, and Me James Mead was. Very significant, isn't it, that the two countries, the, t the, the two leading professors who were pushing for flexible exchange rates in the 1950s came from the two leading powers of the world, financial powers. Britain, the leading financial power of the 19th century, and the United States, the leading financial power in the 20th century. Well, uh, they, they weren't thinking about the world of anything abstract about the world economy. They were thinking about the dollar. The, uh, Milton Friedman was thinking about, why should we worry about the exchange rate? For the, and and there's, that's a defensible position for the United States. But just imagine that when the world moved to flexible exchange rates in 1973, imagine that there were, is now 178 members of the IMF. Uh, and each one of these members all had the same size. Imagine 178 countries in the world, 178 currencies, and every currency the same size. 
Do you know what that means? How many exchange rates there would then be in the world? You'd have to think about. You'd have to think about 15,504. You multiply it a half times 178 times 177. It comes to something like that. Uh, over 15,000 exchange rates. It would be complete chaos. And the only the move we never moved toward flexible exchange rates. We moved to a dollar system. What gave coherence and uh, measure a modicum of, uh, of uh, sens sensible uh, 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 system in the, for the world economy was the domination of the dollar. After all, suppose that the dollar was a, a world empire. Then the dollar would be a world currency. And suppose then uh, the, uh, someone in that said, well, let's have flexible exchange rates. Well, uh, <laughs> There would be no exchange rate, so that would be a perfect system. It wouldn't matter. Well, the dollar isn't the whole 100% of the world economy, but it's 25% of the world economy. And so for the United States, it's a perfect system. But for the rest of the world, it's a rotten system. And it's never worked well. It's why Europe tried to uh, do something about it. It's why Latin America and Asia are trying to do something about it. But why the International Monetary Fund, which is uh, uh, is uh, manipulated by the United States and Europe, uh, is just uh, uh, going to go on its own way. Anyway, uh, the Danes, I'm, I'm sure I, I was spoke uh, harshly about the Danes and their choice, and of course, they you can say they have a democratic right to, to say no on this, and I agree that that's true, but what I think was, I think it was a great mistake on the part of uh, Denmark, and I think it is a mistake on the part of Sweden, and I think it is a mistake on the part of Britain to have a referendum on currency matters. This is not a subject for a referendum. It's not, there's no way that um, uh, the uh, typical cab driver in London is going to become a currency expert and going to be able to talk about the nuances, of whether it's a good idea or a bad idea to do that. He can only listen to what the, uh, what the Murdoch newspapers say and that they're against it and so they're currently against it. But you don't get, in, you don't get any serious discussion going. There's been no serious discussion in the UK about joining or not and there can't be on this kind of issue. Uh, I remember uh, 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 Robert Novak once at a conference was uh, saying, um, saying uh, uh, he, was, he was talking about what, what did congressmen think about the exchange rate for the international monetary system and, and Novak's answer was, well, you know, uh, the congressmen think about exchange rates the way the, uh, the, um, some uh, cleaning ladies think about uh, windows are ironing. Cleaning women sometimes say, I don't do windows. And uh, congressmen say, I don't do exchange rates. Congressmen, congressmen don't do exchange rates, but the public can't make decisions on exchange rates. You would never want not to put it to a referendum uh, uh, in, in, on December the 8th, 1941, should the United States declare war on Japan after Pearl Harbor? The government made that decision. That's what it's elected to do. The government's made, uh, elected to make subtle decisions, uh, taking into account both sides. Maybe you can have an election in between, but uh, let the government make the decision and not, uh, not uh, turn these issues over to a referendum. A referendum democracy is a terrible kind of democracy. Call on Jeffrey Sachs. Let me wade into this also. Uh, first, uh, as always, uh, I learned an incredible amount listening to you, Bob, and this is the third time now in four months uh, also uh, in Korea, so I've, I've really been uh, treated to a great uh, feast again today. I want to I bring you back to the, your original article on optimal currency areas which was uh, one of the great, uh, the great economic uh, path-breaking articles of, of the last uh, half century. And there, if I remember correctly, you treated uh, the optimal currency area issue more as a trade-off than you seem to now, uh, where you had pluses on one side and, and, uh, and negatives on the other side. The pluses of a 
currency union were the reduced transactions costs, uh, the, the benefit of having one money covering a larger economy, and the reduced uh, unnecessary volatility, which you talked about today. But there were also, in the original analysis, pluses of having separate currencies as opposed to having a currency union. One of them, for example, was that the exchange rate under certain circumstances can serve as a shock absorber, not just as a creator of, of risk. And I would have thought that we can see that also at play even now. Uh, let me just uh, take two examples uh, that you mentioned. One is uh, the Canadian-US exchange rate. It does seem to me that looking back on the 1997-98 Asian crisis, when Canada was particularly hard hit because of the commodity price declines coming from the Asian crisis, that the weakening of the Canadian dollar was a, an important counter-cyclical event for Canada that helped to keep the Canadian expansion going. And if I remember correctly, it sure looked like a classic Mundell effect to me, uh, that one of the two monetary regions was asymmetrically hit, its currency therefore depreciated relative to the stronger region, and therefore it was able to get its way through without recession. And I uh, gave that lesson to my family when we decided to vacation in Canada in 1998 because the, the ski area prices were lower, and I told them this was just the Mundell effect at work, uh, and that they should, they should appreciate it. The, the, the second uh, example seems to me, at least in part, to be the, the Euro effect right now. I'm not quite so convinced that the Euro depreciation is just a matter of confidence, as opposed to a matter of the underlying weakness of the real economy in Europe. Europe is not experiencing the new economy in the way the United States is. Europe is a mess of labor market restrictions, overtaxation, and the like. And it seems to me that the relative weakness of the euro may be just what the doctor ordered in a sense. Again, an asymmetric phenomenon where the U.S. has had a positive, very strong productivity shock, which in your model in uh, the early 1960s would lead to currency appreciation. And the euro depreciation seems to me to have helped European unemployment coming down and the European economy relatively strong. And it's precisely the fact that the euro is commanding a stable purchasing power that seems to me to be the best argument for euro depreciation. It's not an inflationary phenomenon. It is, again, to some extent, a counter-cyclical real shock absorber. I know that's not as fashionable now as it used to be in economics, but I actually still believe in these uh, nominal exchange rate movements having their real shock absorber effects. And since I learned it from you, I'm pretty sure it's right. <laughs> but I think that there are two other issues that I'd uh, raise with you as well uh, in terms of optimal currency area. Two other risks that I would add to your 1960s uh, rendition of the balances of benefits and risks. A fourth area and another risk I would add to the shock absorber uh, loss if you peg is that you could peg to the wrong partner. And one of the things that Britain is grappling with is that it doesn't look to Britain like the continental European Union model, not the Euro, but the European Union model is the right kind of economy for the future. And I have my own doubts about the dynamism of continental Europe when taxation is more than 50% of gross domestic product how deeply do you want to bind yourself to a highly labor market regulated, highly overtaxed uh, regime, uh, policy regime that also seems increasingly in some ways to be anti-technology, for instance, in, uh, in agro-technology and so forth, where a technology backlash seems to me to be an odd phenomenon at play. A final point on risk seems to me to be global risk that comes from a single currency, and I'd like your view on that. You're, of course, right that we did have a global currency in 1929. And I think there is little doubt, in my view, that, that the fact that there was a near universal gold standard, or at least a gold and silver standard in 1929, was one of the propagating mechanisms of the Great Depression. That it was very hard to have independence of monetary policy to allow monetary expansion when it was needed. And I wonder if there isn't one crucial fact of 
having a global currency, which is that if you get it wrong, you really make a doozy then. Whereas if you have a bunch of separate currencies and you get it wrong, you get it wrong for your area, but, but uh, the averages uh, work out that you don't make a global disaster. So these are the pluses that I see, the shock absorber, uh, avoiding the wrong partner and uh, not uh, aggregating your risks unnecessarily, unnecessarily. And I thought that the plus minus uh, kind of argumentation was at the core of your original analysis of this, so I'd like your reaction to it. Well, those are very uh, interesting uh, comments and not completely unexpected. Uh, um, my, uh, uh, I, I remember uh, was it someone, someone wrote, wrote, wrote a book, it was, um, oh, it was uh, Robert Sayers on modern banking, and he was talking to a student who said he thought he would write a book, and Sayers said, uh, oh, don't never write a book. He says, you say in it something, then you have to defend that for the rest of your life. <laughs> and it's uh, such a... A big, especially in the more famous the article or the book becomes, the harder it is to, the, the more you're stuck with those things. <laughs> However, um, I have to say that uh, a lot of people use the optimum currency area argument and they throw it back in my face, uh, saying that I don't seem to say, uh, I don't seem to be saying what I was saying then. But I, the first point I want to make is that. Uh, uh, People who talk about the optimum currency area paper haven't read it very carefully. In the very first paragraph, it says the main function of this paper is to cast doubt on the alternative, an alternative to the present system, a system of flexible exchange rates linked to national currencies. It was to cast doubt on flexible exchange rates. So the, it is announced after, in the first five lines of the paper that the article is an attack on flexible exchange rates or casting doubt on that. The second point to notice is, it, is that um, I assumed in that paper for the sake of argument, and this was written in 1961, first presented in uh, 1957, um, I assumed in that argument that the arguments for flexible exchange rates made by the main people who were pushing them, mainly at that time Milton Friedman and, uh, and James Mead, uh, were valid. But what was that argument? The argument, basic argument for flexible exchange rates was that money wages are rigid. It was a Keynesian argument. This is a strange coming from Milton Friedman, but it was a rigidity, rigidities of wage rates. And the exchange rate is a way of overcoming those rigidities of wage rates. And so what it meant was that uh, you have a shock in the country, shock somewhere, declining demand, uh, unemployment, but wage rates can't fall because money wage rates are rigid. Maybe they're fixed by agreements with trade unions, etc. So you can't, all you, you have, you're stuck then with the unemployment. But if you have the weapon of devaluation, you can then raise prices and lower the real value of wages and hope that the uh, workers are going to be fooled by this for as a long period of time. Now, uh, um, I assumed that this argument was valid. I didn't, I said for the sake of the argument, we're going to go on making that assumption, but I never endorsed that argument. And I came very much to disagree with it I never to dislike it, and as much of uh, 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 the rest of the profession came to disbelieve that argument, that you can't fool uh, people very much, very often, by exchange rates. Once you change the exchange rate, um, let's suppose you do this in a small country, depends on the size of the country. Suppose you devalue in a small country. There's not much money illusion attached to this. Very quickly, within a few hours, prices start to rise. All prices of international goods go up and, uh, and there's no money illusion and very quickly people's real incomes are hurt and they then ask for higher wages. So you get no benefits for this. Take a case of a shock that's very specific to uh, regions in a case. Let's take, um, the, take the case of the oil shocks in the United States. The oil shocks to um, 
in the 19, the first shock and the second shock, uh, 73 and 79. Oil went up uh, three or four times in 74, and it went up uh, two or three times more again in 1979. Now, each time those went up, that hurt very much the oil-consuming regions of the world. Look at the United States. The United States, it hurt particularly New England. And you did get, at that time, professors from Harvard uh, arguing that, well, it would be, if we only had a, if New England has a separate currency, uh, they, if they could create a separate currency, then they could devalue, and that would save them from this oil shock. Now, w just think what, think of what they're saying. The big problem for New England is that the oil prices have gone up four times. And they're saying that if we had a separate currency, we could devalue it and make them go up six or eight times. We that doesn't solve that the problem. That doesn't solve the problem. You know, turn it around when it, when it, it, it meanwhile, of course, Texas were, was, uh, uh, Texas millionaires were, uh, were uh, in, uh, in great shape over this period. Uh, but in 1985, exactly the opposite happened. The oil prices collapsed, and if Texas had had a separate currency, they could, uh, they could have devalued at that time. And it's true, Texas in 1985 and 86 and 87 was a kind of basket case. And maybe you can make the argument that if you had devalued, if you had a separate currency and you could devalue it, you could spread the misery a little bit more because there is an element of the shock. After all, when a country devalues, they, they impose a tax on cash balances. It's a tax on money, a tax on cash balances. And that new tax is quite generally felt, and that does have there's some measure to it. But in the process of this thing, you would end up moving the United States with its magnificent currency system that's the envy of the world uh, to the state that Europe is in or was in recently and is trying to avoid. You'd, you'd balkanize uh, the United States the way uh, Europe has been balkanized. I just don't believe the argument anymore, and I don't think that it uh, helps at all. And about the insulation against shocks, including Canada, a change in the exchange rate does, cannot do anything to change the terms of trade. The exchange rate and the terms of trade are a completely separate thing. The terms of trade is the relative price of exports to imports expressed in the same currency. It doesn't matter which one. And the terms of trade uh, it, it can't be changed by changing the exchange rate because you're affecting both sides. This is a mi common mistake. I made this in the uh, uh, attack on the Bank of Canada, who, who was making the argument about the importance of exchange rates. They said that we, we can the head to let the exchange rate change uh, in order to offset changes in the terms of trade. Well, late, I pointed out that was a mistake, and they, uh, they brought that up. But anyway, uh, so that's, unfortunately, that's only the, that's the first question. I'll try to be very brief on the on the, um, on the, let me just the, let me let me just make. Uh, I won't talk. I won't talk about the Europe case. I won't talk about the Europe case. I, and I, uh, I, but just let me just let me finish this one thing about the the thing about uh, this below the belt hit by Jeffrey Sachs uh, when he talked about 1929. Now, if anyone has read my Nobel lecture published in the June issue of the American Economic Review. It makes it very clear what was the situation in 1929. The 1929 arrangement was not a universal currency. It was not a gold standard. This was uh, a badly reconstructed gold standard that hadn't taken into account the fact that gold was undervalued at this time. And it was exactly the gold standard, going back to the gold standard of falsely and badly drove the United States into the Depression. So it was a deliberate creation. Many economists predicted, it said, said if you go back to the gold standard at current prices, you're going to have a, a huge depression recession. And uh, that's exactly what happened. So I think that if he, he would, what I would challenge him to do is to find a case during the heyday of bimetallism or the heyday of the gold standard when a similar thing happened. I, there is, after the Napoleonic War, a similar kind of problem. But I think that his argument there is completely wrong. We're uh, facing the tyranny of the clock.
Our schedule is going to adjust slightly. We will take about a 15-minute break beginning from this time and reconvene for the follow-up lecture.